Okay. All right, so hello everybody. We are MP009 and we're gonna, our project is about the urine cancer drug delivery with the drug Aptalisib. Um, We're part of the Amadi lab, which is a biotechnology and synthetic biology lab. All right, so here's the table of contents. First of all, we're gonna cover um, introductions about us. Now we're gonna have information about Aptalisib, our cell lines and other drugs we're testing. Uh, third, we're gonna have methodology, our current progress and our processes. And lastly, we're gonna have our future steps. So let's start so with- So we'll go over it. So, um... I'm Vishnu Chaka. I'm a sophomore at Washington High School. I'm Manya Shrigiriraju, and I'm a sophomore at American High School. I'm Mahati Shrigiriraju, and I'm also a sophomore at American High School. Oh, I'm Nehal Riburi, and I'm a sophomore at Dublin High School. So we'll start off with some uh, the, an overview of our project and what the problem that we're trying to solve with our research. So. Um, we're just trying to develop a therapy for urine endometrial cancer. And as a brief overview, uh, this cancer originates in the endometrium, uh, better known as the inner lining of the uterus. And it's a critical part of the female reproductive system. And due to its place of origin and uh, it's, you know, where it spreads, it can significantly impact like critical processes like the menstrual cycle and pregnancy, um, and often hinders uh, fetal development and is uh, associated with conditions like obesity excess estrogen and syndrome. So um, there's cancer grows and metastasizes around the body. And uh, specifically for en uterine endometrial cancer, there's two key pathways that um, are mutated in order to exploit these pathways, growth processes. So the first one is for inositide 3 kinase, or else known as PI3K, and mammalian target of rapamycin, of the mTOR pathway. These are key signaling networks in cells. And if there were to be a mutation in these pathways, it could lead to the disruption of processes like cell growth, proliferation, cell survival, and metabolism. So as you can see right here, the um, cancer growth process and metastasis always starts off with a mutation in the growth cell uh, or in the growth. And so when a mutation, uh, often there's multiple mutations that occur in uh, the DNA of a cell, um, mutate the overexpression of the PI3K and mTOR uh, proliferation pathways. And as these uh, cell will basically help as invis invisible to the immune cells, evade uh, programmed apoptosis by cells. And then uh, it'll go on to old cancer growth and metastasis where the, it can then become a tumor. So what makes aptalisib a potential cancer drug and why are we researching it? Like many other drugs, aptalisib can be orally administered, which means it enters the body through the mouth. Aptalisib also inhibits the PI3K and MTOR pathways, and it has a strong potency or influence over various isoforms of class 1 PI3K and MTOR kinase. This means that it is effective even at low concentrations. Using aptalisib, the patient will not need to use an abundant amount of drug to see viable effects, making it a top contender for cancer research. Additionally, because aptalisib specifically targets and inhibits PI3K and MTOR kinases, the drug produces a minimal side effects. Other cancer treatments, such as chemotherapy and radiation, have been shown to produce stronger side effects, and aptalisib, on the other hand, has fewer side effects, making it appealing to many patients. Furthermore, aptalisib was approved as a drug in 2014 by the FDA. So this is the mechanism of action of aptalisib. Basically, aptalisib is an orally administered drug that targets PI3K and MTOR pathways, and it is thought to have possibly anti-neoplastic or anti-cancerous properties since it may result in tumor cell apoptosis, which is the cell program death and growth inhibition of cancer cells overexpressing in the PI3K and MTOR pathways. 
And so the drug will enter from the growth factor receptor and it will either go to the reticular activating system or the PIK3CA pathway. The reticular activating system is a network of neurons in the brainstem that possibly and um, that projects anteriorly to the hypothalamus to mediate behavior, as well as both po posteriorly to the thalamus and directly to the cortex for activation of awake desynchronized cortical um, EEG patterns. So from the reticular activating system, our drug will go to the rapidly accelerated fibrosarcoma, then making its way to the mitogen activated protein kinase, also known as the MEK, um, then going to the extra um, cellular signal regulated kinase, ultimately ending in cell division. So this pathway also induces tumors. So um, the other pathway that the drug can go to from the growth factor receptor is the PIK3CA pathway, which it can also come to from the reticular activating system. So this pathway provides instructions for making the P110 alpha protein. So from the PIK3CA pathway, the drug will make its way to the AKT pathway, which plays a role in cell metabolism, which is how fast the cell grows and the cell growth, proliferation, and survival. From here, it will go to the MTOR pathway, ultimately ending in survival. So the PI3K um, aptolysib inhibits PI3K pathway. So aptolysib targets and inhibits specifically the PI3K isoforms and the MTOR kinase without significantly affecting any of the other kinases in the body. All right, so the mTOR pathway. The mTOR pathway regulates cell proliferation, autophagy, and apoptosis and plays an important role in tumor metabolism and is often activated in tumors. It also manages dream transcription and protein synthesis to regulate cell proliferation and immune cell differentiation. It forms two structurally and functionally different distinct complexes, which are mTOR C1 and mTOR C2. mTOR C1 mainly regulates cell growth and metabolism, while mTOR C2 controls cell proliferation and survival. In tumor cells, abnormally activated mTOR sends signals that encourage tumor cells to grow, metastasize, and invade new healthy tissues. PI3K slash phosphate and fungi homology de deleted on chromosome 10, the P10 slash AKT slash TSC pathway is the main activator of mTOR C1, and gene mutations in this pathway can lead to malignant tumors. Expression of P10 is often eliminated by epigenetic genetic and post-transcriptional modification to upregulate the PI3K slash AKT slash mTOR pathway in most malignant tumors. Okay, the PI3K pathway. Uh, it's also known, uh, as stated previously, as the phosphoenocytide 3 kinase pathway and is a critical regulator of cellular processes covering growth, proliferation, and apoptosis. In cancer, this pathway's dysregulation significantly boosts tumor cell viability, fostering resistance to various therapies. Moreover, PI3K plays a pivotal role in mediating cellular responses to insulin and other growth factors. When functioning improperly, it disrupts the normal range of insulin and growth factor activity, potentially elevating the risk of reproductive cancers like colorectal and uterine cancers. This underscores the pathway's importance as a potential therapeutic target for cancer treatment. Lastly, the AKT pathway. Also known as protein kinase B or PKB pathway, it encompasses a group of three serin slash zero and nine specific protein kinases crucial in transcription, glucose metabolism, cell proliferation, and apoptosis. This pathway promotes growth and cell survival by phosphorylating and inhibiting 4K transcription factors. Forked gene is, the forked gene is involved in development of different organs, regulation of proliferation, and metabolic homeostasis. Activation of AKT is typically initiated by the stimulation of receptor tyrosine kinases, RTK, or G protein coupled receptors, GPCR. Research indicates that the AKT pathway is closely linked to tumor aggressiveness and is implicated in various cancer cases. Increased activity within this pathway has been associated with heightened resistance to diverse cancer therapies, 
Notably, amplifications of the AKT1 gene are observed in gliosarcomas, glioblastomas, and gastric carcinoma, further underscoring its significance in cancer pathology. Okay, the application and side effect of aptilisib. A study was conducted to evaluate the application of aptilisib in a first in human phase one trial, also known as GDC0980. The primary purpose of this trial was to assess the safety, tolerability, and preliminary effects of aptilisib. A total of 120 patients were tested, each receiving a dose of 40 milligrams. Several side effects were observed during the trial, uh, with the most common being hyperglycemia experienced by 18% of the patients. Other side effects include rash, liver dysfunction, diarrhea, pneumonitis, and mucosal inflammation, and fatigue. These findings provide valuable insights into the potential adverse effects of aptilisib and its overall safety profile in critical settings. So these are the cell lines that we are using. In our project, we're using a total of three cell lines, the HCT116, CalU1, and HEC1A cell lines. So we start, first started off by using the HCT116 cell lines to practice our cell culture with. Um, these, this cell line is a human colorectal carcinoma cell line, which was initiated from a male cell line. So it was originally taken from a male. And it has an epithelial morphology, as we can see from the image below, with a doubling time of 18 hours, which is significantly lower than the CalU1 and HEC1A cell lines. So the CalU1 cell lines are the second is the second cell line that we started using to practice our cell culture with. It's a non-small cell lung cancer cell line with an epithelial morphology similar to the HCT116 cell line, you can see it in the image below as well. And it has a doubling time of 37 hours, which is over twice the doubling time of the HCT116 cell. So we can see that it takes a lot longer to grow. And the CalU1 cells um, lack expression in both the P53, which is homozygous deletion, and FHIT, fragile histidine triad tumor suppressor proteins. So intrinsic um, the CalU1 cell line is intrinsically resistant to erlotinib and EGFR um, triazine kinase inhibitor that's used in the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer patients. Then our third cell line, which is also our main cell line, is the HEC1A cell line. This is what we'll be using to test aptilisib and get our main results from. It's the first in vitro cell line of a human endometrial adenosarcoma with a doubling time of 31 hours, which is slightly lower than the CalU1 cell lines, but also a lot more than the HCT116 cell lines. Um, these cells were isolated from a patient with stage 1A endometrial cancer. So the prim our primary objective of our research is to see whether apatolisib produces the intended, intended results when paired with our IUD-inspired drug delivery system to enhance the effectiveness, efficiency of our drug delivery, diminish toxicity, which is often seen with other cancer treatments, and provide a more targeted therapeutic response by targeting, targeting a specific part of the body. So we can either get a null hypothesis or an alternative hypothesis from our project. The null hypothesis means that there's no results and it's void. This is when aptilisib is paired with, when paired with the drug delivery, delivery system does not significantly reduce tumor cell viability in uterine endometrial um, cancer cells compared to standard treatments such as chemotherapy and radiation. And the alternative hypothesis is the hypothesis that we're aiming for, and it's when aptilisib and its drug delivery system effectively reduces tumor cell viability in uterine endometrial cancer compared to standard treatments. Now we're gonna be discussing the methodology of the drug delivery aspect of our project.
Um, can you go back one slide, please? So the first step was growing our culture and designing our drug treatment. We already, as we talked about previously in the last slide, started growing our HCT116 cell line and our HEC and our um, CALU1 cell line. And in the future, we're gonna start growing our main cell line, which is our HEC1A cell line. And we're gonna grow our cancer cells and then add in our treatment drugs. Then a second step would be RNA isolation. In this step, we would isolate RNA from a sample of our cell culture to um, use for qPCR and NGS. Our third step would be qPCR, which we would run using the samples that we collect from RNA isolation. And our fourth step would be NGS, which is next generation sequencing. For this too, we would be using a sample from RNA isolation. And finally, we're going to analyze all of our data and results that we get from RNA isolation, qPCR, and NGS. Okay, so now we're gonna be going over RNA isolation. So what does RNA isolation even do? It separates or extracts pure RNA from a sample of cell tissue. This removes things like protein and DNA that can interfere with the experimental results. This also avoids DNA with non-coding regions interfering with the results, and it prepares RNA for analysis or to be used in various other techniques such as next generation sequencing. RNA isolation serves many different purposes, which will aid us in our project. First, it quantifies the expression levels of the genes in cell samples, so it shows how much of each gene is being expressed. It also quantifies gene activity, meaning that it shows which genes are active or inactive and shows the activity levels of each of the genes and genomes. These results are vital in analyzing our cell culture's gene expression and learning more about our cell's genetic makeup and the effects of our drugs on our cells. We'll also be using the RNA that we extract from this process in future processes such as qPCR and NGS. Could you go? Okay, thank you. So next, so next we're going to be discussing qPCR and its role in our project. qPCR stands for quantitative polymerase chain reaction, and it's an extremely powerful tool used to quantify the number of DNA copies in a sample while simultaneously amplifying DNA targets, which are basically specific sequences of a DNA sample. qPCR is a vital tool in analyzing and studying gene expression which means it helps analyze DNA in samples, which also aids in learning more about our samples characteristics, which helps in achieving our end goal. qPCR can also identify and help us study different mutations and diseases in a sample and can help monitor gene expression, which shows that the, which shows the activity levels of the different genes in the DNA. All of these results will also help us study the effect of our drugs on our cancer cells and on their RNA, DNA, and genes. So how is qPCR performed? A simplified rundown of the process of conducting qPCR is first a DNA sample is purified and then prepped by being mixed with primers and other materials. The next step is temperature cycling. In this step, basically the qPCR machine rapidly heats and cools the DNA sample in cycles. This results in the primers binding to the DNA sample and this also allows enzymes to create copies of the specific DNA set, specific DNA segment. The final step is DNA detection. As new copies of DNA are made through the qPCR temperature cycles, a signal increases. CT values, which are cycle threshold values, reveal how many cycles it took for the signal intensity to reach a certain threshold value. The CT values can be used to track how much DNA was originally present, which is the point of conducting qPCR. We also will use the samples that we get from RNA isolation for qPCR. So next we're gonna be talking about NGS. 
NGS stands for Next Generation Sequencing, and it's an extremely powerful technique that allows scientists to efficiently analyze vast amounts of RNA and DNA of a sample. So what does NGS tell us about our cells? It allows us to identify and study genetic mutations in our cells, such as mutations and variations like insertions, deletions, and inversion. This provides us with vital insight on the effects of our drugs on our cancer cells. Additionally, it allows us to study the gene functions and gene expression of our cells. So basically what the gene function tells us is that it helps us understand what each of the genes does and what their function is in the DNA. And learning about the gene expression of our cells helps us measure the activity levels of our genes in our cells, which can possibly provide clues about the development of our genes, which is important because it can show us how our drugs impacted the development of our cells. A shortened procedure for carrying out next generation sequencing is a sample of DNA or RNA is isolated from a sample and is then purified. This DNA sample will come from our RNA isolation. The sample is then cut into small pieces to which adapters are attached. The sample is then loaded into the NGS machine, which then sequences its nucleotides and genomes. And then this data is analyzed by computers to yield all of the data that we previously talked about. So that was the drug, um, the drug testing part of our project. And now I'll be explaining how we're going to be designing our drug delivery system and that entire aspect of the project. So uh, this is a timeline of how uh, we're going to design our uh, IUD, which I'll explain about later. So first we're going to research what an IUD is, how we can design an IUD and uh, different types of IUDs. Uh, then we're going to determine some preliminary adjustments. Uh, that we need to make to the hormonal IUD to better fit our research purpose. Uh, then we're going to design our uh, model once these things are established in a CAD software, probably like Tinkercad. Uh, then we're going to print out our IUD using a 3D printer software um, in ASDRP, uh, like probably Prusa Slicer. And then we're going to move on to testing and uh, creating a simulation to uh, test our device. So first and foremost, what is an IUD? The full form of IUD is intrauterine device, and it's basically a device that's placed through the cervical canal into the uterine cavity. And it's actually used uh, usually as a contraceptive. And there's two types, uh, there's two applications of this. So for the first is the hormonal IUD, and uh, the hormonal IUD contains this uh, location, right? The, inside this location, the progestin hormone is uh, stored, and then it periodically releases um, the progestin hormone. Uh, which causes the mucus in the cervix to thicken and thus prevents fertilization. Uh, the same with the copper IUD, it works for the same purpose, but it's just a different method. Uh, it's an IUD that's wrapped in copper and this uh, copper release into the womb also, also thickens the cervical mucus, which prevents the sperm from reaching the egg. Uh, and this will come in handy later, the um, location to store medicine. And so our bio design, how are we going to um, basically modify this initial design, this in initial contraceptive to better fit our research purposes? So instead of releasing a copper or hormone into uh, to the site of cancer, uh, we could modify the IUD to release a drug periodically to prevent metastasis and shrink the tumor. And so uh, we decided that the hormonal IUD would probably be the best design for this, since uh, unlike the copper IUD, we can't really wrap uh, the drug outside the IUD. And um, as you can see here, the location to store the medicine, we can just uh, take the drug and then you know store that in there. And then that uh, acts as a reservoir to store and release the drug epidolicid directly into the uterus. Um, and then that, you know, it's, it's effective because it treats directly at the site. Uh, and so uh, real quick to uh, um, overview our design strategy. Yeah, we're going to do the literature dive to understand the design of IUD, which is uh, what this is about. And then, you know, determine exactly what adjustments we need to make to the hormonal IUD so we can use it for drug delivery purposes. And then we're going to... Um, design the in silico model of the IUD in an open CAD software. So like, like I said, Tinkercad, and we're going to upload that STL file of the design uh, to a 3D printer software, uh, print out the IUD, and then create a, a simulation to, to, to study the device's functionality. So now we're going to talk about current progress and what our future steps and future work are going to look like. So we're currently working on perfecting our cell culture techniques and 
we're using our HCT116 and Cal U1 cell lines to do this, as I talked about previously. We're also trying to gain a more proficient understanding of our project because we're still in the beginning stages of our project. And we also already completed our first 3D print using Tinkercad in the lab we use 3D printer. And we initially faced various challenges in team communication and consistency as people were coming in and out of our group and we were trying to set a specific timeline for who's gonna go into the lab one and also developing our cell culture proficiency. So currently we're waiting for our HEC 1A cell line to arrive so we can start practicing cell culture on that. And for future work, we want to perform drug testing and analysis on our new cell line, our HEC 1A cell line, and IUD 3D, um, build our IUD 3D design in an appropriate design software and play around with different softwares. And the material test and design antimicrobial and biodegradable polymers for our IUD. So uh, I would like to conclude this presentation by adding our discussion, uh, what our, the outcome of our research is gonna be. So if the drug is effective in reducing tumor cell viability in comparison to standard methods for cancer treatment, then um, when we test the drug eventually, when we test the drug delivery system, this may involve some implications. So first and foremost, um, like Mahati said, like we need to test the biocompatibility of the material uh, that we use to print out the IUD. So um, can it be decomposed by bacteria? Uh, is it environmental friendly? And um, does it produce the least amount of side effects for the patient? Uh, the second thing is that we need to test its efficacy in vivo. So using live subjects to test how effective our uh, novel method is in comparison to other methods. And again, obviously this is gonna pose various ethical concerns and uh, we're gonna need to go through a lot of bureaucracy to uh, regarding this aspect if we wanna test on live subjects. Uh, and this research is uh, particularly important because it could potentially introduce a novel drug therapy that could be more effective than traditional methods like uh, chemotherapy and combined chemotherapy and other drug therapies. And so we'll, we're gonna uh, approach this by manipulating the tampons properties. So it would become much easier for the patient and much less damaging to treat uterine cancer since we're administering the drug right at the site. And so um, if we were to use chemotherapy or combined chemotherapy or any other type of uh, drug therapy, it, it could affect other sites. Uh, and um, by using our drug epitalicib and uh, the drug delivery system in coordination, uh, we could ensure that we hit the correct pathways and we're preventing the um, uncontrolled proliferation of these pathways and uh, therefore redu reducing tumor cell viability. We'd like to thank ASDRP for providing the facilities and resources to pursue this project. And we'd also like to thank our advisor, Mr. Mahdi, for providing support and guidance throughout this process, as well as our past contributors in our group, Natasha Omar, Barka Trivedi, Nandini Karthik, Nitya Suravaram, and Jocelyn Chong. These are our citations that we used of the sources that we used for this presentation. Thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions?